Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, you are now tuned in to the Investor Show. As always, this is the greatest host of Prince of Investing coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful state of Denver, Colorado. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. So as you guys and girls can see in the description box today, we're going to talk about, and I, this is a late episode, this is the late night episode or whatnot, and I'm bringing this late night episode because I want to talk about, everybody's asking me, Prince, I'm new to investing, I want to start investing, the market is crashing, my phone don't stop ringing, text messages, emails, DMs, everybody always say, Prince, man, how do I get a, um, you know, how do I get into investing? I, I, I want to get into it. So that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do, I want everybody to tell me where you're from. So first of all, we got to do the roll call. Let's let's go here. For the people that ain't here live, we got Michael. Michael said, I'm not missing this one. Toronto is ready to go. What's going on, Toronto? Mike, I see you got his name, Jim Jim, uh, fixed up. And yes, I remember seeing your email, Michael, out there in Toronto, Canada. And uh, yes, um, Terrell Davis, I know you're talking about him. Great guy. Uh, he was in, he starred in my third book. This is Terrell Davis. He started in my third book. I know you said you was a big fan of his, but yeah, he started my uh, third book. We did a launch together, all that good stuff. So we've done a couple of media appearances and stuff like that. So shout out to the Denver Broncos and Terrell Davis, Rod Smith, Von Miller, Emmanuel Sanders, uh, Philip Lindsay, and oh yeah, Brandon Marshall. And the list just goes on. So I, I know you see the big fan of him, but I want to miss uh, get you there. Patrick coming in from Facebook. Lewis, Blue, Brittany, Duran. Oh, I think he's tagging people's name. What's going on there, Patrick? This is the midnight show. This is the late night show. Wesley is going to bed. I don't have to worry about him interrupting me. Wesley is not around right now, so I'm, I'm definitely um, glad of that. What's going on? Chuck is chilling. We got Durbin Smith. He says, what's up, Prince? Beverly from St. Louis. Hey, Mr. Prince. How you doing, Miss Beverly? Okay, Chuck is Chili is coming from SoCal. Tracy Walker checking in from Pennsylvania. He said, this, <laughs> this is a late one. Oh, yeah, this is the late night, Max B. This is the late night show. I changed it to background. This is this is the Denver uh, side, uh, skyline at night for the people that can't see it. Change it to the background to get it up or whatnot. Kevin Woods from Langston, California. Okay, Kevin. We got Antonio Gibbs, he said, I came early. I'm from uh, Philadelphia, PA. All right, good, good. Devin is from Fort Shatner, Hawaii. He's in the house. Let's go, Prince. Okay, cool. We got JW coming from Nashville. Nice, nice. We got Robin Ver <laughs> Ferg, Yorktown VA. I just got the phone with him, too. What's going on, Robin Ferg? He's in here. Uh, Virginia Beach, Woke One says, how low will the market go on Monday? We will see. We'll talk about that a little bit. We got Miss Jamaica. Oh, she's from Jamaica? Right? I'm, oh, she tagged somebody's name. I don't know. Chuck B. Chilling says, he uh, he got my name, 8M, not Chuckles. He got my name, 8, 8M? Not, I, don't, I don't know what you're saying about that, uh, Chuck B. Chilling. Jacksonville, Florida is in the house. And who else is the last one down here? Gary checking in. Gary TH is checking in from Olympia, Washington. I'm glad y'all came in tonight to uh, check me out on this show real quick. But the, today we're going to do a very, very simple topic before we get into it. Let me uh, run this across my, uh, let me change up my little banner real quick. So everybody's asking, everybody's interested in the market right now. Everybody's coming along saying, Prince, hey, I'm new to the market. I never wasn't interested in investing. I'm interested in investing now. Can you help me? Uh, what should I do? Where should I start? What apps should I use? We're going to get into all of that, right? So I'm going to give you all the seven steps I'm going to break down. Here we go. Y'all ready? So the first thing is, first, you got to know your financial picture. What I mean by your financial picture, you need to know how much debt do you have, right? Uh, how much debt do you have? Um, how much debt do you have on, on hand? Knowing your financial picture. What I mean by knowing your financial picture, knowing your balance sheet. How much money do you have? How much? How much assets? How many liabilities? How much liabilities? Cash flow. 
do you make enough money to support your bills? So the thing about it is when some people, you know, I know some people that got four kids, three moms, you know, no stable income coming in. And they're like, Prince, I want to get to investing. I'm like, man, you before you get into investing, you, you got to get your whole financial picture together. Right. So if you're in this situation, first, create your balance sheet. Know how much money is coming in, how much money is coming out and where is your money? So a balance sheet that tells you where your money is. Checkings, savings. Uh, we're doing a, a checking. We're doing a savings. We have a bank account or whatever. So you list out where all your money is. That's what a balance sheet is. Just how we look up these financial statements. You're going to create a financial statement to say, hey, I got five dollars in checking, a thousand dollars in savings, ten thousand dollars in money market account, twenty thousand dollars in the 401k, ten dollars over here. Write all of that. That's a balance sheet. Next, you do an income statement. Income statement, how much money is coming into the um, to the house or to yourself or whatever? How much money is going out? Now, once you do this, you're going to be able to say, okay, well, you know, I work my job. I got a side hustle, whatever you do, my own business or whatever. And this is how much money is going out. Now, once you do that, now you need to know, is this positive or negative? So how much debt do you have on hand? I'm sorry to tell you. If you have a $40,000 credit card that's maxed out, you might want to invest into that credit card, right? So I'm just giving you guys that plain and simple. So the whole thing is this is not a personal finance uh, course or uh, show, but this is telling you, look at your financial picture, get it together before you can start investing. That's step number one. Look at your financial picture, know where your money is, know where your money is going. If you're delinquent on child support and taxes and stuff like that, take care of that first before you start looking into the world of investing. Number two, have an emergency savings. I can't stress that enough. I don't know how many people have called me and say, hey, Prince, you know, I got to liquidate all of my stocks. I got to sell all the stocks or whatnot. Yes, you do have to sell the stocks because you don't have a savings account. You know, you don't want to go out here and buy a bunch of McDonald's stock. And then when your tire blows out, you got to go sell your McDonald's stock just to go get your tire fixed. This is why you need a savings. So I like I like Dave Ramsey's personal finance thing when he says, first, save up a thousand dollars. Use that as your temporary emergency savings. Pay off all your debt. Now, granted, if people got houses and cars, big debts, thing like, but a little frivolous debt. If you owe Macy's a thousand dollars and you owe Best uh, Best Best Buy ten hundred, you know, you need to fix all that stuff up, right? So now you want to have emergency savings because you're going to need emergency savings just in case things get bad for you, right? Number two, because you don't want to. Oh, oh man, you know. I had emergency happen. I got to go sell out of my, my stocks. You shouldn't be investing in stocks unless you have a five year time horizon. At least number three, evaluate your current 401k. If you have a job, if you're in the military, look at your Roth IRA, look at your 401k. If you're a school, a school teacher, look at your 413 Bravo, right? Look at the retirement plan you already have in place with your current employer. Because let me tell you, I'm going to give you guys a backdrop. The reason why they have a 401k, the reason why 401ks are involved is because companies are literally going broke paying, paying out pensions. Ford, for example, Ford is probably paying a million dollars a day or a week. I'm hypothetically speaking. Don't come at me and DM me and say, no, they're actually spending. I'm just hypothetically speaking in pension plans. So a lot of companies out here still pay, paying employees that retired 10 20 years ago. So with the whole idea is to say, hey, look, they come up with a 401k plan to say, hey, instead of the companies worrying about your retirement, we want the people to worry about their retirements. So look at your retirement. So guess what? Now they're giving you a 401k and they're saying, hey, guess what? We'll match you if you invest. If you don't invest, then we're not going to match you. So a lot of people are getting brokerage accounts, putting money into a brokerage account and buying an index fund. I'm like, you know, if you did that with your company, they will match you. That's what I want you to look at. Because some people are like, oh, I'm going to get a, you're right, Prince. I'm going to get a brokerage account and I'm going to get a 401k, right? And you get a broker, you get a brokerage account and you get a 401k. That's not a good deal because if you get a brokerage account, uh, you get a brokerage account, you buy an index fund, you probably can buy that same index fund via your 401k with a job or whatnot. Now, granted, a 401k, you can't push, you can't pull the money out until you're 59 and a half. 
With a brokerage account, you can pull it out at any time. Some people don't like 401ks, but take any, a look at your 401k. Number four. Now you're saying, Prince, I already invested in my 401k. Um, I, I want to, you know, I want something on the outside. When you look at the outside investing, there are only four ways you can invest. Breaking it down, simple and easy. There's only four ways. One, invest into yourself. You know, one, you can get in better shape. Two, you can earn certifications. You can get licenses, become a real estate agent. You can make yourself more marketable. That's investing into yourself. Two, business, right? Uh, either you start your own business, you invest into somebody else's business, all that other great stuff. If you're starting out investing, I'm going to say no to startups. Do not start out with startups. That's my opinion. Do not start out with startups when you're new to investing. Startups are for high-level accredited investors because – I'm not going to get deep into it, but the thing about it is when you're starting and when you're starting out and you invest into startups at first, you probably don't have enough information to really make a good evaluation on a great company. And you're probably going to get finessed. I'm just telling you the truth. So that's number one. You can invest in yourself by making yourself more marketable. Two, you can invest in a business, starting your own business, investing in somebody else's business or whatnot. Number three, real estate. I know I kind of look crazy when I'm doing that the other one, we'll do it the other way around. Number three, real estate, right? Real estate, you can buy a piece of land, you can buy a duplex, you can buy a, a house, whatever you want to do, right? You can and rent out the house to build an income, or you can get REITs, things like that. Real estate. Number four, stocks. Stocks, bonds, mutual fund, ETFs, all that stuff. I consider that stocks. So you got stocks, real estate, business, yourself. That's pretty much it right? And they're all intertwined. I try to tell people all the time, all these things are intertwined with each other. People, guess guess what, right? When businesses don't make money, Apple is a publicly traded company. Apple is a business. If that business does not make money, it's not going to hire people. So guess what? Not only Apple is a business, but it's also a stock. If people are not being hired, people don't have jobs, we're speaking in general, unemployment goes up. Who's going to be out here buying a half a million dollar house? Little to nobody, right? So that's the second thing you have to worry about. You get what I'm saying? So you see how they all intertwine. So if people don't, if businesses aren't, aren't doing well, that means stocks aren't doing well. If stocks aren't doing well, that means they're not hiring people. They're not hiring people who's going to be buying and renting the real estate. You see how they all intertwine with each other? So yes. So now you know if you want to do an outside investment. The reason why I would suggest stocks or whatnot because they're a little bit more simpler to get into. When you get into real estate, you know, you got to get a real estate agent. You got to find a piece of property. You got to go through legal jargon or whatnot. But with a stock, you can open up a brokerage account this weekend, today, while I'm doing this show, and start investing by in the next three or four days, right? So that's why I look at it. So let's say if you decide to do stock. Now you have three accounts you can open up. You can have a brokerage account. A brokerage account is only going to do um, a brokerage account. You can open it up and you can buy and sell stocks. You don't get any tax advantages when you buy and sell inside of a brokerage account. Traditional brokerage account, you have short-term capital gains and you have long-term capital gains. If you make some dividends, the government want a piece. If you buy a stock today, sell it tomorrow, make some money, the government wants a piece. If you hold it for over a year, that's considered long-term capital gains. So you don't get the tax advantages with a brokerage account. The second count you can do is a Roth IRA. You can do a traditional or a, uh, you can do a Roth IRA or a traditional Roth IRA. A tra and that's just how you want to pay your taxes. Traditional means I want to pay my taxes later and I want to defer my taxes and I want my money to grow tax free, which making your snowball even bigger. Or somebody saying, I want to pay my taxes today and then I want to invest the rest. So do you want to pay your taxes now? Pay your taxes later. An IRA. So you can start a Roth IRA. You can start a regular IRA. You can start a uh, brokerage account. And also, if you're an independent self-employed person, you can do something called a SEP IRA, right? I can't remember what SEP meant, but it's for independent entrepreneurs that want to start their own particular IRA. There go your accounts. That's what you can start. So pretty much a Roth IRA, I look at it as if you plan on making more money in the future, I look at it as pay your taxes now. That's me, right? I'm in the military. I plan on making more money in the future. I'd rather pay my taxes now. Second, if I wasn't um, now, if you're someone who's saying, hey, I plan on making less money in the future, then I would say get a traditional. It just depends on how you want to pay your taxes. 
The pros to paying your taxes now, you don't owe them later, right? The cons with paying your taxes now is your money can't grow tax-free. So that money that you was giving to the government, it could be helping build your nest egg. That's the doubt, pros and cons, a little bit of pros and cons with a rock. A traditional, the good thing is your money gets to grow tax-free. The bad thing is when you go to pull out on this money, when you're 59 and a half, Uncle Sam going to knock on the door. He's going to want a piece. So sit down with a tax professional, see which one you would like to do, which one is better for your particular situation. But that's number five. Now, that's number uh, four, right? Getting your own account. Number five, once you have the account, you got to fund it. You got to put money into it. If you got Wells Fargo, you, whatever your JP Morgan, whatever your bank institution is, you got to put money inside of that account, right? So now you got your brokerage account, you got to fund it. You got to put money inside of it. So that can take a couple of days to, to, link, to link up your accounts, put money in your account. Number six, decide what is your risk level. Do you want to be high risk? Do you want to be moderate? Or do you want to be, uh, do you want to be high risk? Do you want to be moderate? Or do you want to be um, conservative? That, what a lot of people like to do that, it depends on your age, right? But it really doesn't depend on your age because retirement is not an age, it's a number. And what I mean by a number is how much money do you need to retire? So with that being said, knowing your risk level, if you are a young person, if you're 35 years old, you plan on working until you're 60 years old, that means you have 20 years or whatever the case may be, you might want to be a little bit more high risk versus if you were, hey, I, I got a settlement, I won the lottery, I got a bunch of money and I'm just trying not to lose it. Now you may want to be a little bit more conservative, right? You just like, I want to, you might focus on a dividend stock. You might be focused on dividends if you are a high risk person. I mean, if you are a low risk person who's trying to preserve capital. I'm 65 years old. I don't like my dad. My dad is 74 years old. He's not concerned with growing money. He's going to be concerned with making money, right? And he's going to be conservative. So he might look at a bond. He might look at a CD. He might look at uh, consumer staple stocks that pay a dividend. So versus someone who may be a little bit more high risk, they may jump into a technology stock. Know your risk level. Know if you're high risk, low risk, or moderate. But always keep in mind, and I'm going to give you guys a secret sauce at the end to figure that out. Always keep in mind, the higher the risk, the lower the return. I mean, the higher the risk, the uh, the higher the return. The lower the risk, the lower return. In general speaking, that's a rule of thumb. Number seven, know your time horizon. How much time you want to give your portfolio? Is this a five-year portfolio? My son, Wesley, is nine years old. So Wesley, that he's nine years old, um, I don't plan on touching his account he's for another decade. And so guess what? I'm going to be a little bit more high risk with his. Now, when he's 18 years old and he wants to go off to college and start a business, get a trade, whatever he wants to do, I'm going to put that money to something more conservative, right? So know your time horizon. If you got a 17-year-old daughter you're trying to send to school next week, you know, if you got a 17-year-old daughter you're trying to send to school next week, then or next month, you may not want to jump into stocks. So know your time horizon. Now, Prince. What is the secret sauce you're going to tell me? The secret sauce is knowing what your number is. When I say know your number, how much money does it require for you to retire? Take me, for example. I'm 35 years old, and I calculate, and I say, you know what? I want to make $100,000 a month when I retire for doing nothing, right? Now, let's say I retire from the military. I earn pensions. So let's say my pensions are $50,000 a year, right? And then let's say my wife, she earns a salary of $50,000 a year. Then let's say if I went and got another career and I earned $50,000 a year, that's a total of $150,000 household income. So let's say if you say, hey, you know what? We're going to live off $100,000. We're going to invest $50,000, right? What number do I need to reach for me to receive XYZ? I need to receive another $20,000. With that, I can tell if I want to retire at the age of 55, I know I have 20 years to reach this particular number. Now, if I know I have 20 years, I know how much money I want to make. And let's say if I plan on living to 85 years old, I know I need to live off this money for what, 30, yeah, 30 years. Now, I know I need to live off 30. I want to make $100,000 a year for 30 years. What does what does that number equal out to? You can sit down with a financial professor or you can figure it out yourself and you can say, hey, you know what? I actually need one point five million or I need eight hundred thousand, whatever you, you may need. And whatever that number is, now you can know now you know how much you can afford and you can say, I need to earn a five percent 
10%, 12%, whatever percentage return on investment to reach this particular goal. And you may find out you might be closer or farther away than you actually think. So know your number. Figure out what that number is. So now that I say that, now that I say that, now let me get into some of the uh, live, the people that are catching this live. Okay, Miss T. Wilson Phillips, she says, oh, she, okay, she already said that. My bad. I'm reading the wrong thing. Oh, she said, I tagged someone. My bad. I'm Jamaican. She's Jamaican and she's living in Princeton, New Jersey. All right, Princeton, New Jersey. Miss T. Wilson Phillips, um, thank you for joining tonight. Hopefully, you got something out of the beginning, what I was just saying. Uh, Kevin said, the late night section. Yes, this is the late night edition. This is why I got the uh, late night Denver edition on. That's my guy, Patrick Clark. Okay, what's going on? He said, what's up, bro? What's going on, Pat? Gary Wallace says, what's up, Prince? What's going on, Gary? Harloon Financials, what's going on, Prince, my guy? He says, Harloon Financial says, uh, I need to hear your thoughts on LK Coffee out of China. Stock plummeted after they got caught cooking the books. Yeah, we're going to look at that. Uh, we're, we're, I can give you my quick synop synopsis. Uh, I had a lot of people, you're not the first my phone ring. I got a text message yesterday about LK. Press, what do you think about LK? And I get so many stock tips that I'm just like, whatever, you know. And I talked to the person today, and it was like, yeah. And they kind of told me the whole thing about LK. They jumped in today. They had people jump in yesterday. So we'll take a look at it for a second. Um, and we got Miss Kristen Johnson. She says, good evening from Palm Coast, Florida. Need to hear this tonight. Okay, thank you, thank you. So for the people that didn't catch it, we went over the seven steps. We talked about first looking at your finances. Um, we talked about having that emergency savings savings account. And we talked about having your 401k together. If you can invest in your 401k, we looked at outside accounts. We also looked at funding that account, finding out what your risk level is, your time horizon, and also figuring out what is your um, – figuring out what your time horizon is and also figuring out what is your number. What is the reason why you invested in the first place? You know, Alexander Wars, thanks for the empowerment. Thank you, Ms. Alexander Ward. I don't know where you're coming from, but uh, thank you. Now, the whole idea behind this is, um, well, let's take a look. Somebody just, you know, let's say Harlem Financials. He just said, hey, I need to hear your thoughts on LK. Uh, Lucan, it says, sound like, yeah, Luckin. Luckin Coffee out of China. Stock plumbing after they got caught cooking their books. You know, when I look at something like this, Harloon Financials, why would I be interested in investing? Unless I was a day trader, unless I was someone who's just trying to catch a little quick move in a stock or whatnot. If you're cooking the books, cooking the books for anybody that don't know what that means, they're lying about their finances, right? If a company is lying about their finances, that means when a company is lying about their finances, that means they're lying to the SEC, they're lying to investors. I don't want to be a part of that. I mean, that's just me. Unless you are a day trader. If you're a day trader, hard loan financials, yes, I can see jumping in there trying to make a quick move. Um, but um, are you looking at shorting? Are you, the, you on the long side or the short side, right? That's what you got to ask yourself. Okay, Miss Athena, Atrina, she, I said it right the other day. She said, uh, what's up, my money team? Georgia is in the building. Okay, that's my home state, Georgia. Okay. Anika Her uh, Hernandez says, I'm new to investing, and I was interested in investing about a week before COVID-19. Do you have any advice about ways to invest now? I've seen some videos, um, but I would like to get your take. What I would say, Anika, I think that's right, Anika Hernandez. What I would say, Anika Hernandez, I would say right now, this is a perfect time to get into the world of investing. We've been in an upward trend bull market for the last 11 years since March of 2009 when the market bottomed out. Now we are in a, you know, this is our first time seeing a market downturn, market down with 36%. Unemployment went up today. Unemployment went from 3.5 to 4.4. But guys and girls, keep in mind, the unemployment numbers only covered until March 12th. The coronavirus did not stop breaking out until after March 12th in America. When it really, when America didn't start shutting down until about the second week after uh, the second week after 
the unemployment numbers was reported. So right now, if I was in your situation, I would take your money. I will save your money. I will build a watch list. What I mean by that, if you have money, put your money to the side, start to build a watch list, start to build a watch, watch list, companies that you know well, companies that you would like to invest in, right? Then you're going to have to do some some um, hard digging. You're going to have to look at the financials of the company. But I'm going to give you a little bit of secret sauce. I tell people this all the time. Ask yourself, what companies were doing very well in the bull market and who are on sale right now and who has a lot of cash to be able to make it through through the next uh, market downturn, right? So ask yourself that. Were they doing very well before the market crash? Prince, why is that important? Because if you were struggling when everybody was doing good, then um, I don't want to be around you. So I'm not going to sign up to be on the struggle bus, right? When everybody's struggling, on, if your company was struggling, if you was <clears throat> Ford, <laughs> GE, if you were struggling during that time, why would I want to take that risk? I'm going to look to a more high quality company that was doing extremely well when everybody else was doing well. And now I see them at a discount, right? So that's what I would start at. And then I would look, I would look into um, who has a lot of cash on hand. So start with what you like, start with what you know. If you're in the restaurant industry, are you in the airline industry? Or if you were in the uh, technology industry, the real estate industry, start in that sector and start working your way down and you got to get your hands dirty and you got to start reading financial reports. That would be my best advice for you. But most importantly, start with the index fund first, please, 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 please. Because the likelihood of you open up a brokerage account, picking five or six stocks and them outperforming the S&P 500 is slim to none. Even the best of the best investors can't do it. 90% of them can't do it. So I would first tell you, start with the index, then work your way up. All right. Max B, what's going on? He said, Prince, did you hear about Macy's dividend cut? Yes, I saw Macy's cut their dividend, and I also saw Macy's got kicked off the S&P 500. Macy's cut their dividend, Ford cut their dividend, and they got kicked off the S&P 500. There we go. JW said, so are you saying we should we should or we shouldn't have another account on top of our 401k? Um, I would say yes, because with your 401k, let's take my full military. People have the TSP, the thrift savings plan inside that 401k. They offer some life cycle funds, which is kind of like L40, L20 life cycle funds. Then on top of that, they have a uh, S&P 500. They have small cap. They pretty much got small cap, large cap um, bonds. Pretty much the savings, uh, government bonds, fixed bonds, and international. That's it. But say if I just want to buy Nike stock, Microsoft stock, Apple stock, I can't do that with my particular 401k, right? Most for, most 401ks can't do that. So if you have an outside account, you can have more self-direction with your 401k. Some 401ks, you can buy real estate, you can buy Nike stock, Amazon, you know, you can do more with it. You have more flexibility with your own individual 401k. The only difference is, depending on your income level, it's only a certain amount of money you can put in there, which is between like 5,500 to 6,000 a year. All right? Max B said also, yes, Robinhood, I didn't get a chance to announce that, but Robinhood, they're now doing drip, dividend reinvestment plan, and they're also doing fractional shares now, which is good. They were talking about it for a while, I should have done a live about it, but yes, uh, I probably do a little video about it anyway, saying that they offer fractional shares, which is good for them. Um, but I'm not a big fan of Robinhood, but that's good. They they said they were going to do it. They finally figured out, I guess, how to do fractional shares. I haven't tried it myself. I know Cash App does it. I know M1 Finance does it. But congratulations to Robinhood for keeping that foot on their necks with getting fractional shares. And also they added dividend reinvestment plan. So great on them. Gary Wallace, what's going on, Gary? He said, Prince, name some of your speculative stock buys, your long shot stock picks. Well, I gave those away probably about a million times. I tell people all the time about Apple, Google, Amazon, pretty much the thing. I'm not big on Facebook. But you know what? I think Facebook is going to do extremely well come next earning. Google, they're all the internet. Apple, Microsoft, Google. Berkshire Hathaway, I'm riding that bus so far. Only thing bad about Apple, 
Apple hasn't been innovating anything since Steve Jobs died. I mean, ever since the iPhone 4, all the new iPhones are just, you know, and me, I'm an Apple person. That's the only thing I don't like about them. Excuse me. So now my big speculative ones, my very, very spicy speculative ones are Uber. I think Uber is, I got to see their earnings. I think Uber Eats is great at this time, but I think Uber just, picking up people, dropping people off. I don't know how well that's going on. So uh, Uber is a speculative stock. Space is a speculative stock. And Tesla, those are my roll of the dice. I'm rolling the dice on Google. Not Google, but I'm rolling the dice with Space. I'm rolling the dice with Tesla. And I'm rolling the dice with Uber, right? Those are my uh, shake them up. Let's see how they go. But the, the ones I feel very sp- uh, very strong on, or you know, the ones I just named the big, the MAGA. And if I, if you don't know what the MAGA is, that's the trillion dollar club M A G A, and that's not make America great again. That's Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Apple. They're on the SP. Uh, I thought they got dropped from the SP 500. You're saying the small cap, I think they got dropped. I, I, I swore they said S was it 300 or 500, but I know they got dropped from a major index and they cut dividends. So, guys, cutting, I always tell people dividends are not guaranteed. Give dividends, they vote on like every quarter at the board meeting. So, just because you're getting dividends right now, don't mean you're going to get dividends forever. A company can cut back on their dividends to save the company. We looked at the finances of the company. You know what? I'm I'm going to take y'all through a look. Let's take a look at Macy's finances. We're going to take a look. Y'all give me one second here. We're going to take a look at Macy's finances. And for the people that ask me that say, uh, Prince, what does that mean? Why Macy's finances matter? I want to show them how much you were spending on uh, what you call it. I want to show them how much I want to see. How much was Macy's spending on dividends? Let's take a look at it. Uh, we're right here. We're going to go to that cash flow statement. Don't worry about it. I'm going to pull up the screen as well. Now, give me one second. All right. Let me share the screen with you guys and girls. So this is Macy's right here. What I have highlighted, you can see how much they were spending on dividends. So you can see it's four hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars. Right. If I'm reading that correctly, but that's what it says. Four hundred fifty nine thousand dollars that they're spending that they paid in dividends. So they spent four hundred fifty nine thousand in twenty sixteen. Make sure I got that year correct. Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen they spent four hundred fifty nine thousand. Twenty eighteen they spent four hundred sixty one thousand. Twenty um, nineteen they spent four hundred sixty three thousand. And this year, as of January thirty first, they had four hundred sixty six thousand in dividends. Now, if you know divi- if you know Macy's, you know they're losing left and right. So they got to find ways to. Um, pick up money. And if you were the CEO of the company, I really don't blame you. Even though it's messed up, I wouldn't do it. Right? Athena says, Athena said, I was just watching this fool last night telling people this is the perfect time to buy GE and Ford. I turn, <laughs> I turn him off. I even know better than that. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not a person, this is a financial education channel. So what I mean by education Versus advice. Education is just showing people, telling people different things, right? And I understand, you know, she's saying that, hey, so I was telling about G and Ford. Me, I'm not big on it. I was a big Ford fan because it was cheap. It was like $9 at one time. It paid a nice dividend. You know, it was a big, strong brand. It's a good way to get in. But when I look at it, I'm like, man, these guys are struggling in the bull market. When everybody's doing well, they were struggling. Who's trying to buy a car right now? Right? Who's at a dealership trying to get the new Ford Escalade? Is it Escalade made by Ford? I don't know. I don't drive none of that stuff. Uh, Expedition. I got a 2007 Saturn View that need a paint job. So, but, so I'm not a car person. But um, I always ask people, 
you know, when I look at it, these companies, GE and Ford, they were struggling in the bull market. That's why I had a problem with them. That's why I, I wasn't on uh, to, what you call it? So that's just my take. Gary TH, what do you think about Mondell's International? Let me look at them real quick. Now give me one second. I don't know what their stock symbol is, but let's try to look it up. Mon. Okay, MDLZ. Okay, so let's take a look at this company together that he just that Gary TH brought up. Let's take a look at it together. Just a quick synopsis, nothing, nothing too deep. So okay, the company costs fifty dollars. It's a um, I don't know a whole lot about the company, but let's take a. That's one thing I don't like about Yahoo Finance. They don't really. It's a little bit harder to find out about the company. But anyway, let's look at it. It's 72, 72 billion in uh, networks. Let's take a look at a quick look at their finances. Right? So their total revenue is kind of staying the same at 25 mil. Um, let's see what else they have here. 25 million operation expense. Their debt, they're kind of cutting their debt over time. The debt is kind of staying the same. The net income, pretty nice net income, three point eight million, three point three million. Okay, so I do like this. The net income is growing. So whatever this business is, I don't even know anything about this business, but just looking at the balance sheet, I can tell the total revenue is kind of staying the same, which is I like to see growing revenue, but the net revenue is is it's increasing. So that could be a sign of they got some type of dual competitive advantage. I like that. Let's take a look at their balance sheet. Total cash, they got 1.2. So this kind of looks uh, okay. You know, they they had 1.7 in cash. Now they're down to 1.2 in cash. That's not too too crazy, but okay. So they do have a little cash on hand. Um, all right. Total assets, 7.6 million. I mean, no, 64 million is the total assets. Total liabilities at 15 million. All right. So the shareholders' equity is 27 million. That's the network of the company. Company worth 27 million, right? And let's look at, I don't know if they pay a dividend. I didn't look. I can tell down here. Yeah, they do pay a dividend. How can I tell they pay a dividend? Right here. So looking at a company, they put out 1.5 million last year on dividends. So they pay some form of a dividend. Um, they pay five million in debt. Let's look at free cash flow. So this is nice. Free cash flow is growing over the years. That's nice. So just a quick look. I don't know anything about this company. I don't know anything about this industry. From looking at this, this would make me look a little bit deeper, right? I would look at this company. You know, let me find another outlet. Let's go to profile. All right. Consumer defense. Okay. It's in the consumer defense sector. And the. You know what? Let's go to their website. Sure. <laughs> That'll tell us a lot about it. But if I was talking to an E-Trade or whatnot, it's easier to see about it. Let's look at About Us. Oh, snacks. Snacking made right. Okay. So even though y'all can see I know nothing about this company, it's a cookie company it looks like, right? Oh, it helps people snack right in 150 countries around the world. Uh, with a future of snacking with iconic brands as far as Oreo. Oh, okay. So right here, we're the largest snack company in the world with a net revenue of $25 million. They didn't got to tell us because we already saw that, right? So this is a snack company. So now I look at this snack company, and now I will compare it to other companies in the uh, industry. So y'all can see how I just went from knowing nothing about this company at all, doing a breakdown of its finances, looking through its uh, finances or whatnot, and then making a, what you call it, you know, that's how I look at it. Gary says MAGA, let me stop this, stop sharing. 
He says MAGA, yeah, this MAGA is the uh that's the trillion dollar industry. Well, a lot of those companies are not worth trillions of dollars anymore because they've gone down. <laughs> it's Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Apple. Oh, Max B said they dropped from the SP five hundred to the three hundred. I'm thinking he's talking about he's talking about Macy's. Uh, three, yeah, she sent Tesla. I'm shocked to hear that. Tesla, this is why. That's I always tell people. With 10% or less of your portfolio, then you can do stuff like that. 10% or less. If you want to put a little spice on your portfolio, those are the companies I just like, okay, you know what? Usually Uber, Tesla, Space are unprofitable companies. That's usually a no-go, right? But I want to give them a shot. This is just almost like picking up a lottery ticket to see what, what happened to them. So that's like 10% or less of my portfolio to say, okay, let's see if they make it, right? Oh, we got Shan. She's here in the building from Memphis, Tennessee. Kendrick Taylor says a snack company. I'm pretty sure they were just talking about the company we was talking about. Chris said they make Oreos and Ritz. Yeah, that was a snack company we were just talking about. Thank you all for backing me up on that. Deadly River said smoking finally got one of these streams. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. Finally catching me. Finally catching me live. Yes, uh, Kendrick Taylor says I think um, how you say the name? Mond Mondale's was part of Crafts before Heinz Craft tied up. I think. Okay, well, I'm not sure of that, but the other thing is, um, I know Berkshire Hathaway Buffett owns a lot of Kraft Heinz. Michael, Michael has a question for everyone. He said, "This question is for everyone. The world is forever changed because of COVID-19, aka the coronavirus. Which companies, industries will blossom or grow because of this?" Now, when I hear this question, Michael, he's saying what companies will blossom because of this. Number one, online companies will blossom. For prime example, well, in the long term, for short term, Costco's, Walmart, I never seen empty shelves in Walmart like this until COVID-19, this panic came about. So I think they forever changed it. Uh, they help those companies, Costco's, they help Walmart, um, they help companies like Zoom. Um, they help companies like uh, Facebook. More people are on social media. I think more people are consuming Netflix, Roku. You know, more people are online now. So I think anything that focuses people to be online, Amazon. Um, I think that's the one that uh, you know. I think Uber Eats might even benefit from it. So Clorox, short term would be like Walmart, Costco's, Clorox, right? But I think long term. You know, I think this showed the value. You know, I'm not going to say the station's name, but I was having a conversation with a station before the COVID-19. And this station, this this uh, it was a station here in Denver, Colorado. And the station, they were they had a small online presence, but it was huge. You know, it, it was a big brand. It was a big name. And they always kept telling me the numbers of how many households they logged into. So, I mean, right now, my YouTube channel, just my YouTube channels alone is almost at 30,000. Um, my uh, Instagram is over 20,000. Facebook, I want to say it's probably about 100,000 with all the different pages. And uh, just my social media presence is pretty, I have a nice size social media presence, right? And I was telling them like, hey, you should focus more online. Your YouTube channel, you guys are huge, but your YouTube channel, you only have 100 subscribers. And, you know, uh, your Facebook page is pretty much non-existent. You know, your, your Instagram is non-existent. And they wasn't really concerned about that. They were like, well, you know, you know, we're a station, we get together and we shoot a show on this date or whatnot. And that was probably in December. So I wonder if I went back to talk to them now, how their comments would change because COVID-19 has forever changed them. Now they're looking at, you know, now I'm not going to lie since COVID-19, I, since this virus thing has happened, you know, I can put out more content and you guys are obviously loving the content. Last month I saw my March numbers. My numbers for last month almost quadruple. They definitely doubled. It was almost quadruple. So when I look at it, I'm saying, hey, well, online is where it's at. That's why I'm live streaming. That's why I'm giving you guys and girls more of what you've seen to tune into. So I think that uh, that particular company, I think they're going to listen to me a little bit different if we were to talk after the COVID-19 is over because now they're stuck with showing reruns. They can't get together at the station and shoot anymore. They're just stuck with showing reruns. I'm like, what are you going to do, show reruns for the next two months? So that's one of the things I want to um, think about. Um, Harloon Financials, what are your thoughts about the unemployment numbers today? The unemployment numbers, unemployment rose from 3.5 to 4.4, 4, 
was a slight rise, but you got to think about it. Those unemployment numbers only counted to, uh, let me let me pull up something for you guys. I'm going to pull up the unemployment numbers for you guys. The unemployment report today that came out. We got a new unemployment. Unemployment now is 4.4. And I'm going to show you guys and girls how to look up this from the Department of Labor. So I'm headed over to the Department of Labor website. So y'all be patient with me for a second. And we're going to look up the unemployment. 2020. Apply. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your secretary. New Cares Act. Today is the third, so it should have came out. I was reading it earlier today. I'm trying to find it. Where are you at on the site? Uh, where is it at? Y'all give me one second. I didn't have this already pulled up for y'all because I didn't think about talking about it. Let's go to Department of Labor and Statistics, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And the reason why I want to show y'all this, I'll give me one second. I'm trying to pull it up on the BOL website. I just had this thing up yesterday, well, earlier today. Department of Labor, yeah. No, that's not it. I'll give one second to find this. I'll give me one. I know I was watching this earlier today. I wonder where is that? Why is it not on here? Why is it not popping up in the talking about respirators? Okay, here it is. I'm sorry about that. I'm crazy. I'm looking right at it and can't get to it. I'm sorry about that, y'all. Here we go. We're going to look up the unemployment numbers. Haloon Financials asked me about the unemployment numbers, so we're going to look up the un unemployment numbers today, and I'm giving y'all that straight from the horse's mouth. So you can see this right here. This is from the U.S. Department of Labor. This was released today, April 3rd. See right here, it says today, released from the April April 3rd, Office of Secretary, right? So right here, Washington, D.C., U.S. statistics laborers following statements on employment. Today's report shows 100, uh, well, 700,000 fewer jobs. Unemployment rate rises to 4.4. Here we go. Now read this. This is where the sauce is at. The report reflects initial impact of the U.S. jobs of the U.S. jobs of the public health measures being taken to contain the coronavirus. So this is saying, OK, it should be noted right here. This is what I want. This is what I want. you. This is the secret sauce I want everybody to listen to. It should be noted that this report surveys only reference to the week and pay periods that include March 12th. We know that our report next month will show more extensive job losses based on the high number of state unemployment claims reported yesterday and the week before. So they're telling you unemployment has risen to 4.4 only going to March 12th. This is not even, you know, Corona didn't really start kicking in until about March 15th, 16th, right? So they didn't. So unemployment was on the rise. It rose up a little bit, not including this. And this is coming directly from the U.S. Department of Labor, Labor, where they're saying right here, right here, we know that our report next month will show more extensive job losses based on the high number of state unemployment 
reports that came in yesterday, Thursday, unemployment, they had about three, three million people file for unemployment yesterday. And the week before, they had another three million. So that's six million. So they're telling you, yeah, we rose to 4.4, but this is not even uh, kicking in coronavirus. So there it is, guys and girls. I showed you that directly. That came directly from the source. Directly from the source. This is showing you from the U.S. Department of Labor. This is not what Prince Dice said, not what I think. Daily River says, hello, yep, I caught you. With any luck, I'll make a million and give you thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that, Daily Rivers. Re Hope you do. Hope we make it together. Prince, what do you think about KR? Let's see what KR is. You know? Let me see here. Give me a second on that one, Max B. <laughs> Somebody just asked about KR. Y'all give me a second. I'm going to come back to uh, KR. Let me get to the other ones. Michael said, great answer. Harloon says, uh, they're saying up with a 30 million could lose their jobs before this is all said and done. Yes, that's true. And the U.S. Labor Department just told you that, right? So I'm teaching you guys and girls how to fish. You don't have to go to, you know, I'm giving you guys raw data. That's what I mean by raw data is this is, this is the this that is what CNN, the Yahoo's, the uh, CNBC's. That's what the analysts are reading and reporting to you. I'm showing you exactly where it's coming from the horse's mouth, right? One second. I hate when it does this. Sometimes my okay. Here we go. So we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into KR. What's up? What's up? Hit the like button. It's free. Checking in, bro. D. Brooks, what's going on, man? Appreciate it. Thanks for checking in, man. Thanks for checking in. Uh, LK Raw, getting my puts ready. I knew the numbers uh, fell low, 70, 700,000, so they are withholding information. Yes, but they were telling you, hey, this report probably went from, April to, uh, went from February 12th to March 12th. That's what they're reporting on. And they're saying, hey, these last two weeks numbers that you guys have seen, this is not included in the unemployment report. So even though the last two weeks jobless claims reports that we saw, they were they are not included in the unemployment numbers that you saw today. Unemployment went up to 4.4%, but the U.S. Department of Labor just told you from their own mouth, be wary, be wary. This is not including these coronavirus cases that we've already saw. So be wary. Harloon Financials. I didn't get laid off until like a week ago, so they didn't count me. <laughs> he said, "He said I didn't get. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm not laughing at your unemployment situation, but I'm pretty sure uh, you said I didn't get laid off till like a week ago, so they didn't count me." <laughs> okay, all right. So we're going to get back to that. D. Brooks, the economy is going to hit rock highs when this virus is over. Invest in the stock market. You're 100% right. We're coming back. So now somebody just brought up, who brought up KR? We're going to take a look at KR. So let's look at KR. We got two people, Miss Cole Williams. She's from, she's from New York. I remember. See, she's from New York. So we got Max B from New Orleans and Miss um, Miss Cole Williams. She's from New York. Max B and Miss Cole Williams thought about the same company. So let's take a look into it. KR, grocery stores. Okay. The Kroger company, right? So $25 billion market cap, nice PE ratio. Let's look at their finances. All right. Okay. Total revenue is okay. Solid. Total operating expenses. The expenses are kind of going up. I don't like to see that just to let you guys, girls, know that operating expenses. They don't have any debt here, so they didn't report it for 20, no, for 2020 for some reason, unless they have no debt, which is very good. Ooh. So right here, when I look at the net income, 
Why did the net income in 2019, it was 3.1 million and then it dropped down to 1.6 million? Hmm. That doesn't look, now granted, this is, that doesn't, I, that's already like, why did the net income drop so much? Total revenue stayed the same. They brought in the same amount of money, but what changed? What changed? Let's look here. Right here. Total other income and expense net. Hmm. So right here, and you can, so you guys and girls can see in a financial report, you seen the company's money shift. Hey, what happened to all this money? Why did it shift? And you're looking at two things that uh, went up, right? You're seeing that the total income and expense net. So now I probably have to read the 10K to see what happened. Why did it go from 1.9 million being added one year to a negative 270 million, 270,000 being taken away? That affects the net income. And also, their income from continuing operations changed. Well, it didn't change. Last year, you can see right here in 2019, they made $3 million in income from continuing operations. You can see in 2017, they had $1.9 million. 2018, they had $1.8 million. But they shot up for some reason to $3 million, and then they kind of went back down here. So this, too, is what could have thrown off the net income. So you can see last year they had 3.1 million in net income. They had a big spike. And you see a lot of that spike is coming from this 3 million that they made. So I would want to look into what is their income from continuing operations? What does that mean? Is that common in this industry? Right? I know Walmart is a grocery store. I'm, I'm guessing that's probably the biggest grocery store, right? If they consider that a grocery store or a retail store. So those are things that I'm looking at real quick. But so that's that is something, something I would highlight. That could be something that could be going on in the industry. So let's take a look at the balance sheets. Okay. Okay, total assets are growing. That's nice. But their total liabilities are growing as well. I do like this, shareholders' equity. Shareholders' equity is pretty much the network of the company. 8.5 million now. It was 7.8 before, 6.9, 6.6. So I like that. You know, total shareholders' equity is growing. And you get shareholders' equity by subtracting the assets versus the liabilities. So some little things. So let's take a quick look at Walmart. Let's see what Walmart looks like. Now, granted, this is not this is not the coronavirus Walmart. This is before the whole coronavirus uh started to break out. Let's take a look at their finances. Since if I'm going to look into investing into a grocery store, don't get so caught up on the price. I forgot how much the price of KR was. Was it like thirty something? If I'm not mistaken. Let's take a let's take a look at them, right? Okay. So Walmart, look how much they're bringing in five hundred million. So way more money than Kmart, right? And then we look at the net income. Let's come on down into the net income. You look at their debt. Their debt is staying about the same. Look at that net income. Now, it did take a dip. It took a dip for two years in 20, 2000, uh, 2018 and uh, 2019. But look at last year. It had a strong year, $4 million, And uh, they almost doubled for some reason last year. Why did they double? Let me see. See? Now, we remember on Kroger, in the same category of income and continuing operations, they had a dec decrease. You remember they went down right here. Walmart went up in that same exact category. So last year, Kroger went up in the same category and made a bunch of money. Walmart, they went up this year and made a bunch of money. So I don't know what's going on with that area, maybe that space or whatnot, but that's to bring up concern. But that's a lot of money right there in the net income. Let's look at the balance sheet. Sixty-one million, sixty-one million in total. At, nope, I'm sorry. Look at that, two hundred and nineteen million in total assets. Two hundred nineteen million, right? Total liabilities. No, total liabilities is one hundred thirty-nine million. Ooh, that's a lot too, right? So the shareholders' equity is at seventy-two million. It's kind of declined. It's well, no, 
yeah, it's kind of staying around the same. It's seventy-seven million for two years, and it's seventy-two now it's at seventy-four. But as you can see, this company has a whole lot. Let's also look at uh, let's look at how much cash it got. Right, they got seven point seven. No, they got nine point four million in cash. I didn't look at Kroger. Let's look how much cash Kroger has. So they had nine point seven million in cash at that particular time. I don't mean they had that every day at the date of that financial report. Let's keep that in mind. Oh, 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 oh. There you go. Sorry, am I looking at, okay. Yeah, right here, they only have 429. So Walmart has about 10 times, more than 10 times more cash on hand, right? So that's just a quick look. I would probably go to Walmart personally just by looking at things. Okay. One thing. Yeah. Okay, Raw, you're right. You brought up a very good point. Kroger may have deferred their debts for one year. And that's something that I had to look more into the 10K to see, right? You had to look more into the 10K to see. Yeah, Deadly River saying, you know, where the, see, that's the things you got. Now you guys are asking what real investors ask. Most people just look at the price. They look at the company name. They look at it, take a dip. Now you guys are asking the right question. Deadly River says, um, where did they spend up half of their income between last year and this one? LK Raw just wrote, hey, maybe they deferred their debt. This is when you know, I'm going to get into the show, too, where we're going to start reading 10K reports, seeing what a company is saying. So, hey, and if you read their reports, they'll probably tell you what happened, right? But these are the right questions you got to ask. These are the questions. Now you're becoming a real investor when you're looking at the finances. I did that before, you know. My buddy came to me and was like, yeah, Prince, man, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about, I'm like, what? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I want to get involved. Wrong answer. That's speculating. An investor is someone who's going to look at a company, Break up in those financial reports, start reading those 10Ks, start interpreting them, understanding the language of the company, and start to realize, like, hey, what are you doing with this money? And start comparing, right? Because you can't be loyal to a company. These are just vehicles to get you to another position. All right. That's why I'm here trying to learn what I look for. Most companies, okay, when sure, okay, all right. So, Robin Ferg said, Prince, what do you think about PLNT? Let's see what that is. What is PLNT? Oh, that's Planet Fitness. I'm probably struggling right now. Well, looking at Planet Fitness right now, knowing it's going to be ugly, I really don't even want to look into their finances because. Uh, you know what? Let's do a quick let's do a quick uh synopsis. Let's look at the chart. You know, how has Planet Fitness performed in the last? Okay, let's take a look. Let me share my screen with you guys and girls and children of all ages tuning in from around the globe. All right, let's take let's go back five years. Right. Okay. All right. 
So right here is the blue line, and Planet Fitness is the yellow and green line. So Planet Fitness, I'm looking at this because I wanted to see how they performed over the last five years. Have they outperformed the market? So this is going all the way back to 2015, all the way to present day. You see they started outperforming the market in 2017. They were doing a good job until they got smashed. So the first thing I look at, Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness got a massive drop to do because no, no, who's been working out this quarter? They're going to go two months. Next quarter, they're going to go two months without anybody working out, right? So now we're looking at this is the P.E. ratio. Okay, so they, are, they were a profitable company. I said were. <laughs> so now let's look at their quarter. Total revenue last quarter. Total revenue from last quarter was 191,000, right? 191. Am I that's supposed to be in millions or I'm messing that up? No, it would have said millions, right? It's 191. So 191,000 was their total revenue for a quarter last quarter. Now ask yourself if they made 191 in 3 months. That was their total revenue in 3 months. Right? Their net income. Their net income in 3 months was 29,000. That's what we're seeing in 2019. So now if you divide 29,000 into three, that's three months, that's $10,000 a month, right? That's the, that's what they take home into the company, a net income. So you can almost bet your bottom dollar they're probably going to miss, they, they miss half of March, so that's 5,000. They're going to miss April, that's 15,000, right? So, and let's say if they did kick it back on in uh, June or whatnot. That's half of their net income that's just going to disappear. If you go by last quarter, that's in a quarter. Half of it, they're going to look at at least probably about a 50% drop. That's what I'm just going to suspect, unless people are paying their memberships anyway. But if that was me, I probably would have cut my membership and said, you know, I, I'll be back when I get back because if the shoe was on the other foot, they wouldn't do it for me. So, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the quarterly, right? So we're going to go back. See, right here, you can go from quarterly to annually. So they were a profitable company, but right now I think they were worth what was the price of uh yeah, 36 bucks right now? They're gonna drop, man. They dropped 7% today for whatever reason. And wait till their quarterly reports coming out. I wouldn't even touch this this company because no one planning fitness, a gym, nobody is doing anything in, in a gym um now. So let's look at how they was performing before. So one good thing is they before this all happened, they did have growing revenues. So we're looking at total revenues were growing at this time, right? The cost of revenue grew a little bit, but let's look at their net income. Look at this. That this is pretty this is pretty impressive. Look at their net income. They went from 21,000 to 33,000 to 88,000 to 100. That's that's very beautiful, guys and girls. That's probably the best one we've seen so far. So that means that every year this company is taking in more and more money. The revenue, the total revenue is growing. The money they're taking home is growing. That's a good sign right there, right? Now let's look at their debt. Now the only debt downside to this too is their debt. Look at their debt. Their debt is growing as well, 27000 35000 50000 60000 So they have growing debt. How I know their debt is growing? Because I can look at the, the interest expense. So the interest expense, that's very important. Let's say if you got a company and you got a line of credit. Yeah, you're making money, but you owe so many other people. What good, what good, is it, good does that do? I would like to see that stabilize and drop. But one impressive thing is the revenue was growing and also their net income was growing. Let's look at the balance sheet. Let's see what money is in the bank. Now, what's going to be very important when I look at this, how much cash does this company have? Why is cash going to be so important? Because they're going to need this cash to be able to make it through this rough time. Because I don't think people are going to be back in the gym by May. I think people may, let's say they lift the band in May, People going to be in, you know, no, who's going to be like, oh, let me run to the gym and try to, you know, no, 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 no. I think that they may have to go a whole nother month. So we know they was making $30,000 a month. So let's look at it. If they was bringing in $30,000, let's say if they didn't bring in that $30,000, and let's look at how long could this company last off of its cash. We can go back and look and see how much money. So all you got to do, right, look at the income statement from 20. Uh, let's look at the quarterly statement. The quarterly statement, I can look at this and say, okay, 
They brought in $191,000 in revenue. But by the time they paid their taxes, the people paid their, their they grossed $191,000. Right? I'm looking at the quarter, right? So now when they paid all their bills, so here we go right here. Their total operating expense is $34,000. So it costs them $34,000 a quarter just to stay alive. So how long can they live off that cash before they go bankrupt? So that's another equation you can do. How long can you live off those bills before the cash will run dry? So that's why total cash would mean a lot to me in this particular situation. So the total assets was $1.3 million. Their total liabilities is $1.7 million. So when you look at this shareholder's equity down here, it's a negative. I can't even yeah, hide this thing. Get this thing out of the way. So you can see down here, once you subtract the total assets, the total assets in the company. I'm on annual. Yep. Making sure I look at the annual. From, from last year, they, the total assets in the company was $1.3 million. But their total liability is $1.7 million. Maybe it's because of machines they own. Maybe they owe, you know, I don't know what it is about this particular company, but it comes out to, you can see it's been negative for a long time. Now, when I look at this, I got to go look at Anytime Fitness. Let's look at Anytime Fitness. Let's look at somebody else in the industry. How do they compare to this? So they were looking good, but when it got down to this balance sheet, they're not looking too hot right now. They do have a nice little chunk of cash on hand to be able to help them out a little bit, but uh, I wouldn't even touch a gym stock until, I think you're going to get a way better price if you just wait until the summertime, at least. Hopefully that makes sense, Robin. Hell yeah, that's my man right there, Durrell. What's going on? He said he's checking in live for the late night show. Yeah, this is a late show. Um, I use the first 10 minutes of the show to really show people about investing and all of the good stuff, how to get into it. And the rest of them just talking to you guys and girls. Eric says, thanks for the live stream tonight. Interested in what stocks could be good candidates for puts in the next few weeks. Bet against real estate. Um, I think real estate is going to come down. Look at Planet Fitness. It's probably a good stock to best bet against, <laughs> you know, uh, because I know that profits are going to be cut. You know, I had to look and see how much the stock has dropped already. But. Those companies like that, um, I think airlines got some more to do. We're going to get the next, it won't be until May. The first Friday of May is when we get the real unemployment numbers. Unemployment numbers came out today, but they only counted into May 12th. So that didn't look good. So, uh, yeah, I think real estate is next because when unemployment is creeping up, unemployment rose to 4.4. We lost 700,000 jobs, not including Corona. I just, for people who are just checking in, we just, let me just show it to you guys and girls again. I don't want y'all to say, oh, Prince said, Prince ain't said nothing. I'm sorry about showing that stream anyway, but I'm going to show you guys and girls here. Prince ain't said nothing. He, I want y'all to go back and say, hey, Prince showed me. This is what I learned. I'm teaching you guys and girls how to fish on your own. So right here, this is coming from the U.S. Department of Labor. Came out April 5th, April 3rd, I'm about to say 15th, April 3rd, right? That is today. Right here, they told you right here, today's report, today's report shows 700,000 fewer jobs. Unemployment raised to 4.4. Prince, okay, yeah, we know unemployment was going to raise, but guess what? Here's the secret sauce. It should be noted that this report surveys only references to the weeks and pay periods that included March 12th. So they're telling you this report only went to March 12th. Everybody know Corona didn't really start kicking off until like March 15th, right? They told you we should uh, we know that our report next month will show more extensive job losses based on the high number of state unemployment claims reported yesterday and the week before. They're talking about the job jobs claims that came out on Thursday and the Thursday before. So, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. If people don't have jobs, if people are losing jobs, who's going to be buying houses? Who's going to be renting houses? Right? You know, are you going to be out there? You don't like somebody here said, Harlem Financial said, man, I just lost my job. You know, I just got laid off. 
and I'm going to go get unemployment. Do you think he's in the market to go buy a new house right now? Probably not. So if you keep, if houses stay the same, let's go have a basic economics class, the supply and demand, supply the amount of houses. So we don't get the new building permit reports until April 16th. Building permit reports are very important because before somebody can build, they must submit a, a permit. So when we look at the building permits, did building permits stay the same? Did they increase? That could be a great indicator of people building houses. So a supply stays the same. But if demand starts to drop, right, because people don't have houses, I mean, people don't have jobs, they don't know when they're going back to work. So if, if supply stays the same, demand starts to drop or, or stay the same, if demand stays the same or drop, meaning that people are not out there trying to buy houses as much as they used to, now people are going to be wondering, hey, man, is my house corona free? Have y'all done a corona inspection on my house? So people ain't going to jump into a house. I'm in a housing market myself. So less people are jumping into houses. You know, beginning of the year, I was on the phone every day with a real estate broker. At least my wife was. Hey, yeah, this is what we're looking at getting. This blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, this or whatever. This is the price range we're looking at. All that stuff. Now, those conversations got very quiet. This is a perfect time for me. I retired from the military in like three years. I want us to go through this decline now. And hopefully in two, three years from now, we're picking up out of this right when I retire. Perfect timing. But so that's how I look at if supply stays the same and demand starts to decrease, price comes down. Um, Michael said to everyone out there, all the best in your investments. I feel like we're all on the same team <laughs> coming from Toronto, Canada. That's what I'm talking about. All right, let me get some more of these questions in before I got to get up out of here. D. Brooks, three years ago, I invested $1,000 and doubled my money. Sell it February CST is the stock. CST, okay, he said three years ago, he invested $1,000 and doubled his money. Uh, sell it, I'm guessing he's talking about February. CST is the stock. Derek Smith said, Prince, can you look into MX? Not right now. I don't want to look into another one right now, right? <laughs> Not on this one. I want to try to get to everybody else's questions. I'm going to have to get out of here, too. Right, Derek said, "Can you look at the MX? Been looking into holding. They haven't affected by the CV crisis. It's almost like they're bulletproof." So he said, "MXRT, MKTX. That's the symbol. Maybe a little bit later on. Walmart is so much larger than Kroger. We will have to look at the ratios to really see how much better one is over the other." Yeah, you're correct. Right, and what she's talking about is you break it down to percentage. So just because a company has more money doesn't mean they're better. Right. Let's say, let's take two investors. Say if an investor said, hey, I made $1,000. And another investor said, hey, I made 500. People are automatically going to think the investor that made $1,000 is a better investor than the person that made 500. But if the person who made $500 told you they started with $5, and the person who invested, or who made $1,000 told you they started with 900, then that changes everything. So when she's talking about his percentages, because when you, in that scenario, when you break down percentages, you're going to see that somebody made, a thousand percent return and somebody else made a 10 percent return so you're absolutely correct to look at the ratios of who's doing better not just the numbers of oh he's doing this you gotta look at the ratio you're absolutely right lk raw why would a company defer their debt tracy walker ask yourself this question why do we defer student loans <laughs> you know people are uh you know people because companies are like hey you know instead of paying this debt now i can defer it Right. I can defer it to next year. Right. Some company they may have something else they want to pay. It could be a lot of uh, reasons for doing that. But it's the same reason why do we defer student loans. Some people defer their student loans because, hey, I ain't got the money. I don't want to pay it right now. I'm trying to do something else. It could be other things. And usually that's broken out in the actual report, in the actual financial report. And usually the CEO usually would tell you that on an annual report or in the quarterly report. And people would ask that question, hey, why did you defer your payments? But a lot of people, that's pretty common. People usually, uh, a lot of companies do defer their payments to another time, just like regular people. Like, I guarantee you, a lot of people are deferring their mortgages who just lost their job, or who have no income. Oh, he said, oh, good question, Tracy. I like the yes. I hope I answered your question too, Mike. We got Corey Touchstone coming in from facebook he said hey hey here from mississippi 
I'm just tuning in. If I had two thousand dollars that I had, that I had, that I I was willing to risk, what would be the best interest to invest in the main stocks or spread it around? Okay, um, Corey, if you're brand new into investing, thank you for tuning in for the first off for the late night edition of the Investor Show. I would say if I had two thousand dollars, I'm I'm not going to go into your whole personal finance. I'm just saying I'm just looking at the investing. If I had two thousand dollars, if I was a high risk person. If I had a, and it all depends on your time horizon. Now, if you got two thousand dollars to invest and you need it by next year, then I would probably look into a CD, or I probably would look into a bond, you know, a US a, a T bill, because your time horizon is so short. But if I had more than five years, if I had ten years or something like that, I and I was trying to grow my money and I was trying to buy a stock, I would probably zoom in. If you're very bright, the the industry that's taking the biggest hit has been the energy sector. So energy sector, technology sector, I think are going to rebound the biggest. I think right now it's a rubber band. I think they were here, a rubber band got pulled down. And when they let that rubber band go, that thing is going to shoot up. So I would look automatically into those particular industries. Either if, you, if you're if you saying, hey, Prince, I'm not that smart. I don't know what companies to pick. You can purchase the whole sector. You can invest into the entire technology sector. And let me give you the symbol, too. Because a lot of people like to, you know, I hate when people tell you stuff, but they don't tell you anything. If that makes sense, you know, but this is not how the investor show shows you. We will actually give you stuff to look up and to get into. Uh, whatever. No. What happened to my watch list? Did they update my watch list? Oh, my God. Oh, wrong one. I'm sorry. Okay. So the energy sector, XLE. X X Ray Lima Echo Technology Sector X L K X Ray Lima Kilo. Those are the two sectors. That's the entire technology sector, right? Those are the sectors that's gotten hit the most. They were doing very well in the bull market. They've gotten hit the most. And you would take a less risk if you went, if you're on the high end, the high risk. I would probably look into the you know what? I'll probably look into the yeah, that individual sector. If you want to drill down and get individual stocks in the technology sector, of course. Go for the big boys. Look at the Microsoft. Look at the techno. Uh, look at the Apple. Look at the Microsoft. Those guys. Google, Amazon. So, but if you were going into the energy sector, I don't know that energy sector very, very well. But you have to do a little research, and maybe you can find some nuggets that can spring back. That's I would find a company that's heavy on cash, that was doing well in the bull market, that uh, who's having a little drag right now, and who has a lot of cash on hand. That I, that's like a springboard. So. Um, if you don't want to drill down that far, just get the entire sector. That's if you're high risk. Now, if you're saying, Prince, I'm more conservative. I want to make some money, but I don't want to be stupid. You want to make some money, but you don't want to be stupid. Then I will look at um, something like the NASDAQ, right? The NASDAQ is the index. You can invest in that by ETF QQQ, right? That's Quebec, Quebec, Quebec. And what that does is that tracks 100 mostly of the technology stocks. Yes, they're going to have lower lows, but they usually have higher highs in the long run. When you stretch out the S&P 500, the Dow Jones and NASDAQ, the NASDAQ, yes, is more risky, but it does make a better reward. Now, you want to be a little bit more conservative, but you want to invest. Now you want to be a little bit more conservative. You may want to go to a total market index fund, which is the total, all the markets around the world. Or you can look at the S&P 500, top 500 companies in America. That's what probably I would look at with $2,000. Best of luck investing, Corey Touchstone. Thank you for uh, tuning in. D. Brooks CST invests. I doubled my money. Okay. He said he's it's cheap now. It was, he said it's now, it's $15. It's cheap now. It was $15. It's like $5 now. Okay. So he said now invest. Okay. I don't know what CST is, but that's true. Daily River said, H E H, I took my membership fees and I just put it towards my home equipment. I feel like I made the right choice. Mm. Okay. Harloon Financials, um, I'm probably going to cancel my membership after this. I don't even want to go back. Harloon, what, what you, your membership on what? I think I'm missing something. <laughs> oh, I think he's talking about Planet Fitness. Yeah, especially Harloon. If you got Harloon, if you like you said, you lost your job. If you lost your job, then I will stop everything that's going out of my account. I will stop everything. Miss Tara Jackson, a personal finance expert that came onto the show. That was some good information she came out with. She said, stop everything that's coming out of your account and you question everything that's coming out. 
you know, something you need, you might want to do, change a card number. You change a card number, that stops automatic payments. Now, when the Netflix says due, you decide what you want to pay. You got to ration out your money and negotiate with everybody. If it's a mortgage, if it's rent, negotiate. Um, if it's life insurance, negotiate, <laughs> negotiate. Keep your capital to you until you figure out what's going on. Deadly Reverend, no, sir. It'll be mid. It said it'll be mid June at best before people come back, and I really don't think it will happen even then. Yes, I don't think Planet Fitness could be like June first. Come on back to the gym. Everybody, like, oh, jumping and sweating all over the place. I think people are going to be like, eh, I don't know. Let me. People are going to be out there working out with a mask on, gloves, <laughs> you know, all the other stuff. Gr, oh, what's going on? He said, "Hey, Prince, greeting from the beautiful Los Angeles, California. What's going on, Gr?" Prince of the Big A, can you do MFA? Now, I'm, I'm done with looking up stocks for the night, guys. I've been on here about an hour and a half, so no more looking up uh, stocks. Next next show, okay? Daily River says, River said, oh, real estate, evil laugh insurers. <laughs> so he's probably looking at the real estate like, ooh, ooh, you're looking real nice. Michael says, thank you a million for another brilliant show. All right, guys and girls. Uh, yes, that's what I'm going to go ahead and conclude this. You no, know, I've been on here almost an hour and a half. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you guys. And hopefully, y'all got something out of this. Um, so yeah, hope y'all got something out of this. Hope y'all take something away from it. Um, I love doing these, and I uh, thank you guys and girls for tuning in. Don't forget that like, subscribe, share button too. But also, if you want an autographed copy of my book series, Wesley Learns, that's my children's book series. If you want to support me, check out my book series, Wesley Learns. We got Wesley Learns to Invest. The world's first children's book on investing. Wesley learns to invest, followed by Wesley learns about credit, followed by Wesley learns about insurance. The world's first children's books teaching kids the principles principles of insurance. Yes, that's named behind my son Wesley, who you guys always see come down here messing with me. But I got a good night on a late night show. He's in a bed. He's sleep. He's out cold. I don't have to worry about him. It would be hilarious if he just came in here right now and just popped. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so, but if you want autographed copies, send me an email, prince at childrensfinancialliteracy.org. I wish all you guys and girls the best out there in the world of investing. Be patient. Uh, be patient as we navigate through this bear market. In 2008, I was just coming onto the scene investing. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to buy. Didn't know what was going on. And I did the worst thing in the world. I started selling, taking my money out. But this time, I'm going to navigate this bull a whole lot better. And uh, so because I probably won't see another one till I'm in my 40s. So, uh, yes. Well, yeah, thank you guys and girls. Thank you all for tuning in until the next video podcast. Let me get some of you guys saying thank you. Uh, J- uh, Miss Tracy Walker saying thank you. JW, he's saying thanks, Prince. Have a good night. All you guys and girls have a good night. And until the next video podcast, cartoon or whatever else you see me do crazy across the globe. Peace. Be safe. I'm out. Thank you. Oh, well, well, Michael got this in. Michael Davis, what's going on? He says, thank you for all that you do. I'm just getting off. I usually watch uh, the video on the drive home. I was totally surprised to be on live. I have been watching you for three years. Good show. Michael Davis, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good show tonight. This is the late night edition that we did tonight. So uh, thank you, Michael, Michael Davis, on his drive home. He says he's checking it out. All right, cool. But y'all also can get all the playbacks. They're going to be on Spotify. They're going to be here on YouTube. They're here everywhere. So thank you, guys. Miss uh, Miss Cole Williams says thank you. Yes. Thank you, guys, for tuning in. Until the next, let's try this again. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else you see me do crazy around the globe, peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you.